for a check. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast. Today's guest is actually kind of a guest. It's Professor Paul Nuyu Jukian at uh, Stanford uh, Brain Interfacing Laboratory. And uh, he did a really good breakdown, deconstruction of the Neuralink Monkey Mind Pong. And, you know, it was so good that I, I just wanted to uh, play it here with his permission, of course, on this channel. So you can hear what an expert has to say about the, the big news with uh, Neuralink and uh, the 2000 channels that they implanted in a monkey. The monkey was able to play Pong um, pretty well. Better than me, honestly. And, uh, you know, he was rewarded with a, a banana smoothie. And so I, I want this machine as well. And just as a point of clarification, Dr. Nuyajukian uh, didn't specifically endorse this video or endorse this channel, but uh, we are using uh, this video under the Creative Commons uh, license. Hi there, my name is Paul Nujukim. I'm an assistant professor of bioengineering, neurosurgery, and electrical engineering at Stanford University. I direct the Brain Interfacing Laboratory, which is a research group at Stanford. I have an MD and a PhD in bioengineering, which means I'm a doctor, an engineer, and a scientist. For the last 15 years or so, I have been a brain-computer interface researcher spanning both non-human primate work as well as clinical trials in people. And I'm here to give you an expert opinion on the recent Neuralink Mind Pong video, because to me, it represents some pretty exciting steps forward in the field. Now, before I get into that, I need to go over a couple quick disclosures. This is just my own opinion on speaking for the university. And two, I'm not affiliated with Neuralink in any way. There's no, I've never been paid or consult or received any resources from them. Uh, they didn't ask me to do this. Um, no one is, no one is, is twisting my arm to do anything like this. Uh, the, the field of neuroengineering is relatively small, so I do know a lot of the people that work there uh, or advise there in various capacities or have worked there. Uh, and it's important for me to just maybe make a couple of notes. Um, my PhD advisor and postdoc advisor, Krishna Shanoi, is an, uh, an advisor for Neuralink and has been since day one. And uh, my other postdoc advisor, Jamie Henderson, uh, both of these individuals are faculty at, at Stanford. Um, what has for the last couple of years been an advisor for Neuralink as well. So those are two sort of potential disclosures I should just put out there. Um, but understand that I'm not privy to any information that's, that's, you know, be in it, that, that I have any insider information or anything special because of the relationships, um, of being in the field. Uh, I only know, uh, what, what is out there publicly. Neuralink is a very private company and has remained that way. Um, but I have an expert sort of experience. I have an expert opinion in this space because I'm in this field. I've been following Neuralink very closely since it started because it's directly working in my space. And, um, I can share a lot more about what's in this video because they put a lot of stuff in here that would not be obvious to, 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 um, someone not in this field. And I'm here to sort of share more of what I see and why I think it's exciting. So with that out of the way, uh, let's begin the video and, um, and go through it. This is Pager. He's a nine-year-old mechanic who had a Neuralink placed in each side of his brain about six weeks ago. If you look carefully, you can see that the fur on his head hasn't quite fully grown back yet. Okay, so right out of the gate, there's already a lot being communicated here. Um, what you're seeing is a rhesus macaque monkey, which is a very common animal model in the field. It's the same monkey that I work with uh, in our research group um, for our animal studies. It's got you know, 100 plus years of history uh, that has contributed to systems neuroscience, and much of what we know about the brain is because of the rhesus macaque. Um, what you're seeing is Pager, this is the monkey that, that is in the video, is interacting with this task while sitting on, seated on this you know, really nice you know, comfortable looking, uh, or appropriate for a monkey, at least comfortable looking, um, wooden, wooden looking branch, uh, sort of perch. Um, this is, this is flexing neural, this is Neuralink flexing their highly enriched environment here. The monkey is, you know, fully, fully unconstrained, just sort of climbs up and starts participating voluntarily while they're in this, you know, really pretty, uh, enclosure that's plastic. And I'll show you more about the plastic enclosure in a moment with the background that's got, you know, this faux woodland forest scene. So as far as, as far as their environment, their enrichment environment for the monkey, it's, it's a highly enriched space that's, that's, um, that's very conducive to, uh, to, um, 
happy, happy, uh, a happy, uh, a happy animal sort of interaction. The the little piece they were talking about about the shared uh, the shaved piece of head that's that little bald patch you're seeing on the top of the head um and that's because when they did surgery they shaved off the all of the thick fur so they could get access to the to the scalp um and then implant do the implantation now one of the things that's very interesting about this is that had you not told me that 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 was that it was shaven for the purposes of an implant i would have never been able to tell uh the vast majority of this type of work is using wired implants that have external connectors. So there's hardware that's visible from the outside. Uh, and here you're seeing for the first time, um, you know, high channel count implants that are fully implantable that are basically invisible. So once this hair grows back, I wouldn't be even be able to tell you that the animal had a surgery. And that's sort of a, an important consideration from a cosmetic perspective. If this is ever to, to if these devices are ever to make it to be white, you know, to be accepted. Um, by by people for for uh, for therapeutic use. Let's keep going. It learned to interact with a computer for a tasty banana smoothie delivered through a straw. We can interact with the Neuralinks simply by pairing them to an iPhone, just as you might pair your phone to a Bluetooth speaker. So here they are flexing again. All right, this is yet another Neuralink flex. Um, They've got. They're showing off that the inner, that the actual interface from their Neuralink device um, from the N, from the N1 is, is actually a Bluetooth interface. So you know, there's an iPhone paired with the paired with Neuralink that's picking up debugging information. It's it's a it's a really nice demonstration of you know using industry standard protocols to build you know proper engineering infrastructure on top of this type of an interface. This view is actually also really nice because you can see a bit more about the about the about their enclosure. Right here is the corner. That's a corner gusset. Here's another corner of the wall um, that's made up, and so you can actually see the reflection of the of the person who's holding the phone. Their hand is like right. Their hand reflection is right there. So that's the. There's another piece of plastic right in front here. That's uh, that's you know. Uh, separating the person from the animal so that the animal can, you know, safely uh, interact with the task without any concern. It's a, it's a really nice setup that they, that they, that they've created. The links record from more than 2,000 electrodes implanted in the regions of Page's motor cortex that coordinate hand and arm movements. So here they are again, you know, flexing once more. Um, that's a 2048, uh, electrode implant. That's 1024 on one side, 1024 to the other side, bilateral. Each of the links gives you 1024 channels. That's an order of magnitude higher than what we, what is currently clinically approved, uh, for, for this type of work, which is the Utah electrode array, which only gives you a hundred channels. That, that device, that, that, that electrode implant, uh, that electrode array is, a, is 20 years old. And so this is the, this is, uh, you know, a, a promising new point of technology that, that we hope, um, will give us an order of magnitude more more channels than what we currently have. I'll also point out that while we're looking at this view of the task, this is this task is something that's actually very, very dear to me because I actually created this task uh, when I was a graduate student. It's a grid task. It's a six by six grid. And it's this, this implementation that they're doing here. So there's 36 total options that the monkey has to pick one uh, to communicate the, to communicate the signal of interest. If he chooses the wrong one, he gets it wrong. And because you've tiled up the workspace this way, you've turned the system now into a communication channel. And that's what this little marker here is talking about. This is a bit per second text. This is the maximum bit rate. That's the, that's the current running count bit rate. And so there you're seeing the actualized uh, maximum and, and current throughput information transfer, right? Actual bit rate or achieved bit rate of the system. Um, through through the interface, and this is really exciting because this is actually what we did in our in our studies as well. Uh, if this is of interest, here's some papers that talk about bitrate, and the one in which we introduced this metric is this one here, um, task optimization, the 2015 paper, and then in 2017 we we add a click decoder using an HMM to make it even faster. So you know here are some of the papers in the field that talk about bitrate, um, and I'll come back to this again. This isn't fully exhaustive, but it's just some of the ones that that highlight these ideas. Let's keep going. Neurons in this region modulate their activity with intended hand movement. For example, some might become more active when he moves his hand up, and others when he moves it to the right. 
So that's not anything surprising uh, for the field. We've known this for decades. But what is very interesting is in the blog piece, they actually show us a, a plot of that tuning profile of all 1024 channels, uh, presumably in pager. But they don't, they actually, I'm not sure they actually specify which one. This is very impressive because, because what we have is the larger the sphere, the stronger the depth of modulation, the smaller the sphere, the less important that that electrode is contributing to to the to the tuning. Um, and each this each of these pillars represents, you know, 16 of the contacts on that on that wire that's implanted. And if you play this video all the way out to the end, they actually then go and co-register it over the piece of brain that is that it's being implanted in um, in in presumably Page's brain. And so this view is actually really pretty, which shows to us, it's another flex, right? That shows us that they know where every single electrode they're putting in is relative to the surface of the brain. Now, this may not mean, mean this may not be very informative for you, but again, for a neuroscientist in the field, you know exactly where this is. I know exactly where this is because this right here is an anatomical landmark that's unmistakable. It's the central sulcus. And anterior to that is Premotor uh, is is motor cortex, um, and then premotor cortex would be further anterior to that. This could be right the spur of the arcuate somewhere in this area. It's really hard to tell whether it's this or that, but I'm not going to venture too much. What they're clearly in, I need I would need a larger a larger view to see for sure. But what they're clearly do get in is motor cortex, and they're getting lots of modulation here and not so much modulation here. Um, and you know we've never I've never seen you know, a modulation plot with this much density before because we don't have 1,024 channels ever recorded from um, in, in the system. So this, this actually has significant neuroscientific value just as it is. Let's go back. By recording from many neurons and feeding their activity into a decoder algorithm, we are able to predict pages intended hand movements in real time. First, we calibrate decoder by recording neural activity as pager uses the joystick to move a cursor to targets presented on the screen. So that's nothing, you know, that, there's nothing surprising there. This is just explaining how you build a decoder. It's all, it's all standard in the field. As he's playing this game, we are wirelessly streaming in real time the firing rates from thousands of neurons to a computer. So... Here we get a first little glimpse of of uh, the console, and I'll just point out one something real quick before I let it let it continue because this view is really nice, uh, or or has something that I can't see in a later in a later segment is that it's Friday eleven forty one a.m. when this when this when this uh, when you know when Pager is playing. So this is the, you know that when exactly in time this is happening, which is which is pretty cool. Using these data, we calibrate the decoder by. Okay, I've stopped it again because I actually want to talk about the the various items that we're seeing up here on this top row. Uh, this the, the the panel here is very informative and and shares a lot of information. Um, the the item over here, oops, the item over here is a MAC address, and more of it was visible earlier, which is the actual MAC address of the radio. This is the firmware revision number. This is which of the chips of the 256 channel chips that are doing that implantation. Uh, that, so each chip is 256 channels. Each of the, each chip has 16 wires, and each wire has 16 electrodes. So each chip is 256, and there's four chips, 1024. That's where they get 1024 per Neuralink uh, device. That's the signal strength, the RSSI signal strength, just like your wi your Wi-Fi signal strength of how well that the the Bluetooth signal is coming through. This and this represent the coil voltage and the charging rate uh, in milli in, in microamps of the inductive coil that they can recharge the battery with. And obviously, it's sitting at negative voltages and negative microamps because it's not charging right now. It's nothing connected. It's just it's fully it's fully wireless. Um, or it's it's not. There's no there's no inductive. There's no coil based charging thing applied right now. The, the monkey doesn't have anything on the head. And this and this represent the battery state. So this is 3.6, 3.7 volts, which to me signifies that it's just, you know, it's probably a, a, a lithium ion battery. And this here is the drain state, which means that's the amount of mi uh, microamps or milliamps of current that are being, that are being consumed right now. That's 17 Point three. If you do the math on this, you get to something that I believe is around 64 milliwatts of power. 
Um, this is also milliamps, which given the fact that they're doing bin streaming spike data is not bad at all. That's a super low power device, um, to, especially since we're talking about 1,024 channels. To do that in 64 uh, uh, milliwatts is, is dang impressive. Uh, it's, a nice, it's a nice piece of equipment. Uh, here we see some humidity, temp pressure, and temperature debugging information. That's you know very nice to see. That's funny to see. Um, it's just impressive that it, that it, you know that, that they built that in. Hibernation, auto wake. This is you know presumably sleep states about the system. Drops. I'm guessing that drop has something to do with like the the amount of network packets coming off the Bluetooth chip that are being dropped. Is is my guess what that is? I don't know what interval means. That's not. That's not. That's pretty vague. Streaming is just as it says that the system is streaming. It's two little nods here that are that are interesting for neuroscience. So this is a raster plot, right? Each as you go down this way, you're walking down the channels. Each one is a different electrode, and this is time, presumably in those 25 millisecond bin time. So the brighter ones are larger, act, higher activity, and the the dimmer ones are lower activity. There's two aspects here that are worth pointing out that are that are interesting to neuroscientists. There's a little knob here that shows that you can tweak between normalized versus non-normalized, and that just means that you know they're they're scaling each of the channels. Uh, with respect to some normalized parameters, so that no single channel that's super loud drowns out all the others. It's 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 a you know a, a, a something that's conventionally done in our field. And this this is really interesting. Where um, this says you know choose the channel of interest and press the enter key to hear spikes. And that's just another little nod to what we do in neurophysiology because that means you can pick a channel and actually listen to the spikes pop 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 uh, as it comes through. And that's just you know how we how we often. Um, listen to our data as we're ca as we're capturing it there's uh, a lot of information down here as well in the lower sections that that are that are that are you know really really sort of interesting to see this little this little blurb i think is probably aggregate activity and so you can sort of see that this this patch of the area is much brighter than the rest i think what that that's what is the signifying it could be one channel but it's it's not exactly well well explained these are buttons to toggle different types of rec recording modes in so switching on you know broadband for four channels versus uh, 20 channels and whatnot and this indicates here that they're able to record channels of broadband activity off of the system as well as conduct impedance measurements and in spike measurements and that's the button right here that says impedance which is cut off a little bit uh, importantly right there tells you the date of the experiment of this study right um, this happened on April 2, 2021. This is just over, you know, just, just a week ago. And they're, they put it out there less than a week or two later, because this was 402 and the, and the video was published on the 9th, uh, or on the 8th, I believe. Um, so, you know, within a week, they, they released, they released this video, which shows them sort of how recent this all is. Uh, this little log actually is extremely informative because it tells us the nature of how the broadband channels are coming out. The fact that these are spaced out every 10 seconds and there's here that says 10 seconds of broadband indicates to me that the system is capable of streaming one channel of broadband at a time and not more, which makes sense because they're using Bluetooth, probably Bluetooth 2.1 because it's really low power, which has got about a, you know, upper bandwidth limit of around two megabits a second. And that you don't really want to, you don't really want to stress the system uh, and consume a lot of power. They could maybe go to Bluetooth 3.0, but I doubt they've implemented that way. Even though it's got 24 megabits a second of transmission, it burns a lot more power. So here you're seeing that the system is every 10 seconds switching between channels. Uh, and that's for that, that, carol, uh, that actually matches up exactly with these, right? 433, 468, 617. And it's 433, 468, 617 here as well. So that all makes sense. This is actually really flexing what they can do. Impedance measurements, broadband, bin spikes. Here are different modalities of what you can measure and stop streaming. Here's a little like, you know, ZMQ data stream, which is, you know, a network protocol that's used for, for, um, you know, common modality to, to encapsulate and abstract network streams. Is ZMQ is a, is a, is a, is a high level library for socket programming or Unix socket programming or other types of things. But that's what they're using here. It even tells you what port they're, they're broadcasting on. So, you know, pagers, pagers, uh, stream off of that MAC address is, is sitting at port five, five, uh, five, 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 six. I just don't know what IP address it is. That's the one thing that I, that I don't see. Um, I'm guessing this is UDP and not a TCP stream because if it was TCP, I would expect this drop number to be at zero because TCP is a handshaking protocol. So they're probably implementing a UDP ZMQ stream over these 5556 port. Uh, this last one presumably is this implant settings uh, toggle which lets you turn the chips on and off or turn one or more of them on and off at any given time. So if you want to scale it down and save power and only use half the, ch half the chips, 
uh, and half the channels um, because you want to turn off a particular chip altogether. I, I presume you can do that with this console. There's a lot that's being shown here that is is you know really interesting to see and hasn't been disclosed before. Uh, the, the, the system's pretty sophisticated. It really is. Mathematically modeling the relationship between patterns of neural activity and the different joystick movements they produce. After only a few minutes of calibration, we can use the output from the decoder to move the cursor instead of the joystick. Pages still moves the joystick out of habit, but as you can see, it's unplugged. He's controlling the cursor entirely with decoded neural activity. So this is the first time we see an actual BCI being played live. And this is this is this is very cool because you know there's the indication that the little the little uh, connector for the joystick which was normally plugged in is now disconnected. That looks like a micro USB connector to me, um, which makes sense because it's probably just you know a conventional computer that they're that they're doing all the displaying through. Um, and there's now you can actually see the the brain activity. Um, or the, the the bit rate in in uh, of the brain computer interface, and its max hit was three point six seven, which is a respectable number. It's not groundbreaking, but at the same time, I don't think they've necessarily tried to optimize the algorithm yet. Um, they're just they're just you know running running a running a brain machine interface um, and measuring their and measuring their uh, measuring their their output. The the specific decoding algorithm isn't really disclosed but there's actually ways you can tell what they're actually what they're running um, if you look carefully at the cursor uh, unlike the hand control one if you go back to the joystick control and you see how quickly that one just sort of stops right on and that goes into a set still uh, this one sort of drifts a little bit when it's trying to stop so you know it's under it's under brain control but the other aspect is that it's making the selections not be a dwelling like it did in the joystick one here there's definitely a click implemented meaning there's both a velocity in x and y decoding as well as a click intention to choose a, a target uh being decoded why because some of these target selections happen way too fast for it to be a dwell and there's no way they could do that if unless it was there was a click decoding being implemented. So this is actually both a, a, a velocity decoder plus a click decoder running in parallel. I can see if I can point out a couple of those elements as they as you see them. Our goal is to enable a person with paralysis to use a computer or phone with their brain activity alone. Because they wouldn't be able to move a joystick, they would calibrate the decoder by imagining hand movements to targets. There. So that last one, for example, is a good example of one that sort of clicked really quickly um, when when you know it it it, it shouldn't have um, or it couldn't have if it was a dwell. So if you if you pay close because attention would, to these, is um, the person with paralysis. Wait, the earlier ones were actually with better decoded about this. neural activity. There, that one, for example, as well. They, it clicked way too fast, um, so that it wasn't actually being triggered by a dwell. This is definitely running an HMM. And so basically, if you see it clicking you know, as it's ripping through one of the cells very quickly, one of those targets, and then it clicks, then that can't happen because of a dwell detection. So it's it's definitely running a, a, a click decoder as well, which is which is cool. They haven't talked about that. Enable a person with paralysis to use a computer or phone with their brain activity alone. Because they wouldn't be able to move a joystick, they would calibrate the decoder by imagining hand movements to targets. So that is just um, a description of of um, here are some freely moving papers that have you know various forms of wireless or implanted sort of technology that's that's uh, that's uh, relevant to what what they're talking about here. Um, but you know the the imagined movements uh, the imagined movements and being able to train the cursor is just uh, you know uh, commenting about the other types of human work in this space that's happened. All of these are human intracortical papers. That that build decoders in various ways, and since these individuals are all are all have paralysis, um, you have to kick the you have to bootstrap the decoder off of imagined movements, which actually ends up modulating the the brain activity in the same way. One of the things the neurolinks allow Pager to do is to play his favorite video game, Pong. To control his paddle on the right side of the screen, Pager simply thinks about moving his hand up or down. We removed the joystick altogether. Now that he's up to speed, let's increase the difficulty and see how well Pager can play the Neuralink. So this is this is really nice. Um, it's a very cute demo. It's you know it's a game which is always fun to, to fun to see. 
uh, from a technical standpoint, the previous the previous decoding algorithm that's doing cursor plus click is way more technically sophisticated because this is just a one D task. But uh, I get why they did this because it it it's you know it's easy for people to remember uh, and and capture the imagination. Um, but this technically is a is a simpler task to perform. Uh, the actual behavior itself is probably harder to learn because it's difficult for an animal to understand the games of things like physics and walls and bouncing uh, as we understand it. Um, all that being said, it's it's a nice demonstration. As you can see, Pager is amazingly good at mind palm. He's focused, and he's playing entirely of his own volition. It's not magic. The reason Neuralink works is because it's recording and decoding electrical signals from the brain. Great game, Pager. And what better reward for a monkey than a banana? We still have challenges spanning many fields of engineering. So if you're good at solving hard problems and want to change people's lives, even if you've never worked with the brain before, we would love to hear from you. So that's the end of the video. Um, and, you know, this is, this is a really, in my opinion, um, pretty compelling demonstration of a company that, that, you know, has built brand new hardware from scratch and, and has gotten it working fully implanted, wireless, rechargeable, uh, Bluetooth streaming, um, in a primate, which is sort of the last step before you then apply for an FDA ID exemption to conduct your first clinical trial. Uh, assuming this is representative and I have no reason to believe that it's not, um, and they've done everything you know, carefully, meticulously, have all, they have all their documentation in a, in a row, which of course they, I think they do because they've been very careful. I expect them to be, um, to be very close, if not already submitted their FDA ID approval, uh, or some, uh, uh, application. And that means that, you know, if everything, if everything tracks as, 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 uh, as it would appear, they should be ready to to you know enroll their first participant, uh, the, their first participant with paralysis, um, within the coming year or two. That's that's well within that's well within the timeline. It's a really exciting time for our field because for the first time in 20 years we have you know we're on the cusp of a new device that might be useful. Uh, it might be that might be you know FDA FDA approved for clinical trials um, to to record multiple channels from the brain. And, uh, and and multiple neural uh, multiple neurons uh, multi-channel neuron activity from the brain. And it's not just like a hundred channels anymore. We're an order of magnitude higher than the Utah electrode array. So we're long overdue for for uh, for a step forward. And this is really exciting because there's tremendous clinical potential for this. There's even tremendous neuroscientific potential for this. You know, I would I would I would very much welcome having these types of devices um, available for for research in the in the monkeys that we work with in our group. Um, so I'm. I'm very excited to see what what you know that that this that this video came out and there's a lot in here much of which I wasn't really able to to comment on or only mention in passing but for an expert in the field this video represents a pretty big step forward for us and um I look forward to seeing I look forward to seeing the next steps. Thank you for the time. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.